Thank you for joining me in the special collections of the University of Oklahoma Libraries. Let's see a few treasures from the vaults that will throw light on science and the printing revolution. A small but beautiful manuscript in the Bazell Bible Collection is this book of ours, produced in manuscript about 600 years ago on vellum. The colors remain brilliant and beautiful. Accompanying text is handwritten in an exact and legible style. This devotional work was published in northern France, perhaps a generation before Gutenberg. Gutenberg printed the Bible with movable type in 1454, and what we now call the printing revolution changed the world. OU does not have an original Gutenberg Bible. This is rather an exact facsimile copy of one of the surviving Gutenberg Bibles. It was created by hand in 1913, so it is a valuable book in its own right. This huge, heavy folio volume is only half of it. There are actually two volumes. It's open to the first page of Genesis. The text is laid out in two columns, printed in a Gothic font. Early printers needed metallurgists to shrink the typeface to reduce the size and overall costs of books. After printing the text with movable type, copies were hand-colored or illuminated. On this first page of Genesis, six scenes along the left-hand side depict the earth during the six days of creation. By the sixth day, land animals were created, and the illumination explodes into a riot of life from Adam and Eve on the left to the peacock on the right. Gutenberg printed 180 copies, some on parchment and most on paper. 48 copies are still extant. 50 years after Gutenberg, more than 10 million books were in print. This is the earliest Bible in the Bazell collection, printed by Anthony Koberger in Nuremberg in 1479. It is bound in discarded sheets of vellum with older music still legible. Like the Gutenberg, the Koberger Bible is a huge and heavy folio. It is not for taking with you under your arm or for holding in an easy chair. Yet, by developing a slightly smaller typeface, Koberger was able to shrink it down into one large volume instead of two. The Koberger Vulgate is one of the earliest Bibles to contain a woodcut, here hand-colored. Koberger also printed the Nuremberg Chronicle, one of the most lavishly illustrated books of the 1400s, the first half century of printing. Erhard Redolt was another important early German printer. He moved to Venice and set up shop there. How important are geometrical diagrams for works in the exact sciences? Redolt used copper wire molded into geometrical shapes to print the diagrams. This was much more efficient than carving woodblocks. Redolt also printed the Calendarium of Regiomontanus. This work is often regarded as the first book with a special first page. There is no title yet, but the date of 1476 appears. A calendar was a series of astronomical predictions. These tables, with their straight rules and combination of red and black ink, are a spectacular example of the early printed printing arts. Regumontanus here predicted the positions of the sun and the moon and the occurrences of lunar and solar eclipses for 30 years. Circular calculating devices are called volvels. Here's a volvel for calculating the position of the moon. The book itself has become a scientific instrument. In this copy of Seneca, we see an example of a printer's device. A printer's device is the logo of a printer, in this case, Aldus Minutius in Venice. One of the great achievements of the Aldine Press was the six-volume edition of the works of Aristotle 
in Greek. The font is simply beautiful. Early print shops were a remarkable cross-section of society. The household of Aldus in Venice included over 30 skilled craftsmen, skilled in the variety of book arts, which included font design, typecasting, typesetting, paper making, printing, binding, illuminating, and woodblock carving. Participants included the master printer, artists, tradesmen and tradeswomen, authors, multilingual scholars, translators, copy editors, indexers, proofreaders, suppliers, salesmen, investors, accountants, and many others. One of the effects of the printing revolution was the widespread availability of images. Printing catalyzed a spectacular transformation in the use of visual representations across all fields of knowledge. We can see this, for example, in two works on mineralogy and metallurgy. This is the Pyrotechnia by Birunguccio, printed in 1540. It covers the arts of glass making, smelting, assaying, and metallurgy. It must be Gandalf's fireworks manual. This beautiful work is Georg Agricola's De Re Metallica, printed in 1556. Agricola described early modern mining and metallurgy practices throughout the German-speaking areas of Europe. The remarkable illustrations, page after page, make De Re Metallica a paramount example of how abundant visual representations transformed science and technology. An English translation of Agricola was prepared by a U.S. president and his wife, Mr. and Mrs. Herbert Hoover. This is an inscribed copy. Another effect of the printing revolution was the reconfiguration of disciplines, as topics traditionally encountered within a single discipline might migrate to new contexts and cross-pollinate new disciplines. For example, this mathematical discussion of the optical effects of the atmosphere, namely the formation of a halo around the moon, appears in Aristotle's Meteorology. This is one of the most interesting uses of mathematics in all of Aristotle's writings. Yet in this manuscript from the 16th century, we see two different transcriptions of the same university lecture by Erasmus Reinhold. The diagrams are nearly identical to the discussion of halos in Aristotle's meteorology. The most significant change is the setting. Reinhold was a well-known Wittenberg astronomer, sympathetic to Copernicus. The migration of this diagram from meteorology to optics to astronomy illustrates both the remarkable interdisciplinary character of meteorology and the changing boundaries of disciplines in the printing revolution where migrating topics reshuffled early modern disciplines into new permutations. The printing revolution also encouraged humanist habits of scholarship, the comparison and collation of texts. This is the Geneva Bible, printed in English in 1560. The first thing one might notice about it is the small size. It fits in your hand, it's lightweight, it's portable. Second, it's written not in Latin, but in the vernacular. It's both portable and designed for the layman. The title page indicates that it is translated not from Latin, but from the original languages, reflecting up-to-date scholarship with most profitable annotations upon all the hard places. Contrast the readable typeface of the Geneva Bible to the Gothic fonts of the other Bibles. Even though it's smaller, its clear, readable type appealed to lay readers, in contrast to the hard-to-read Gothic font of other Bibles. In contrast to large altar Bibles like Gutenberg's or Koberger's, the small typeface made the Bible portable and affordable. The Geneva Bible was made not to sit on an altar, but to be taken in hand and read and carried to church or to the pub. 
On this first page of Genesis, we can see introductory notes at the top. The text is broken up by numbered verses. These are the first verse divisions to appear in an English Bible. The popularity of the Geneva Bible made its divisions endure. They're the ones used today. Marginal explanations on all the hard places didn't hesitate to promote the theology of the Protestant Reformation. The verse divisions and cross-references encouraged a profound change in the act of reading. Readers began to pay less attention to a single unbroken text and to pay more emphasis on comparing and contrasting diverse verses, moving back and forth between different chapters and verses at will. For all these reasons, the Geneva Bible represents the subversive potential of the printing revolution. It was the first lay study Bible, written in the vernacular, portable, affordable, designed for self-study. It was the Bible of Shakespeare, of the Puritans, of the settlers in the colonies of New England, and of Scotland. Lay study of the Geneva Bible, often in small groups at local pubs, helps explain why English translations of the Bible so vexed Henry VIII. The king lamented that ordinary peasants, instead of accepting what they were taught by bishops, now disputed, rhymed, sang, and jangled the scripture in every alehouse and tavern across the land. In contrast to the Geneva Bible of 1560, this is the first edition of the King James Bible, published in 1611. Immediately we notice that we're back to an altar-sized Bible rather than a handheld one. When we open it up, Notice the return to a Gothic font, appropriate for a Bible that was designed to be read by bishops in the church rather than by laity in their homes or taverns. The King James has the same verse divisions as the popular Geneva Bible and plenty of cross-references, but no theological annotations. James was Catholic and intended to replace the subversive Geneva Bible with an English translation that was cleaned up a bit, replacing troublesome words such as congregation with more traditional words like church. Above all, as a king of England with a thick Scottish accent, James desired a translation with rhythm and cadence that would sound beautiful when read aloud on solemn occasions. This is another vernacular Bible, Luther's German translation, the story of the Bible and the printing revolution is an instructive example for exploring how a more widespread availability of texts shaped society. In the 1520s, fully one-third of all books printed in Germany were written by Luther in German. Across Europe, vernacular publications energized emerging nationalist and religious movements. The Protestant Reformation, like the Scientific Revolution, would hardly be conceivable apart from printing. Therefore, many argue that the printing press then caused greater cultural changes in Europe than the computer has yet wrought in ours, until we see the political transformation on a supercontinental or global scale. While we have Luther's German Bible before us, let, let's notice that this copy was published in Germantown, Pennsylvania in 1743. The first Bible printed in the colonies of North America in a European language was this Bible in German, not in English. Printing required not only a market for books, but the establishment of a colonial paper-making industry. The publisher of this Bible, Christoph Zauer, nearly went bankrupt from giving copies away to poor families. He was saved by the Continental Congress, which needed a printer. Let's conclude our exploration of the printing revolution with two examples of the book arts. First, consider this Greek New Testament, published in Oxford in 1763. If you look at the text block from the side, all you see is a gilded edge. 
But if you rotate, if you roll the pages to one side, a four-edge painting of a street scene is revealed. Then roll the text block in the other direction to show a second four-edge painting. This one is a river scene. These scenes are visible when the book is open before you, one on either side. Four-edge paintings remind us that the meaning of the book only appears to us while we are reading, not when the book is unopened or on the shelf, for then they, it disappears. Second, consider this modern edition of Galileo's letter to the Grand Duchess Christina. The case opens to show the size of a miniature version published about a century ago. This edition, printed just for fun in 1967, is smaller still. This little book will fit in its entirety on the surface of a nickel. In summary, there have been at least four revolutions in written communication. The invention of writing, the alphabet, printing, and the internet. One might wonder which communication revolution has had the greater effect to date. Science is a story. What stories do you want to hear and tell about the printing revolution?